Today's video is going to look at our different urban models for the development and patterns that we see in urban settlements. So the core of this, is, this video is going to highlight the, I, the models themselves, the concentric zone model, the sector model, the multiple nucle nuclei model, the concept of urban, the urban realms model, and the peripheral model. Um, we'll also touch on the concept of sprawl, um, but this is something we've been talking about all along the way and we'll continue to address uh, more specifically moving forward. Let's get started. Taking a look at the concentric zone model, uh, the first one, uh, very similar to when we looked at the von Thunen model, the whole concept of the concentric circles that um, based on a market center. But instead, of, uh, compared to the von Thunen model, the concentric zone model, the, that center market is our central business district, um, or our CBD. Um, where we don't really have a population center. It's really a, a convergence of services um, that are provided um, that have a large threshold and a large range um, that we might look at where people converge to come to utilize those things. So we have a central business district, a zone of transition, the zone of independent workers' homes, um, a zone of better residences, and a commuter zone. And so let's look at these a little bit more specifically. Uh, basically, we, with that first, if we think of the five rings, the starting with the central business district and moving outward, um, the zone of transition is where we find oftentimes the older and m most, of, most of the time in U.S. cities, the poor quality housing, or um, sometimes the, uh, uh, in terms of socioeconomic patterns. Um, we also see some industry, um, and there's a transition where this maybe is turning from industry to poor quality housing. Um, and basically it's, it's mixed in between. This is also where we see um, immigrants tend to live. In the third ring, we have what's called the working class zone. These tend to be marked by smaller homes. Um, the, they're more densely populated neighborhoods. Um, the yards tend to be small, and the families tend to be small. These tend to be younger people, younger couples work that tend to commute into um, the, the CBD or work in the area. Um, and oftentimes you're going to find this, these would be the single young people as well. The fourth ring um, is going to be our newer or our middle class. These tend to be bigger yards. These, these would maybe be considered your what's considered the suburbs. Um, we're going to see um, a, a, a higher range of, of socioeconomic status, and you're also going to find um, bigger families. More uh, this is, tends to be also marked by other characteristics like um, uh, better support in the school system. Um, you're going to see more um, residential versus commercial. Um, services that are there. And then we can finally go out to the fifth ring, which is what's considered the con commuter zone. In other words, people have to travel uh, quite a ways into usually places near the CBD for places in terms of employment. Um, these are almost marked entirely by residential areas. There's very little um, commercial or, or industry in these services, uh, these com commuter zones. And if we look at this model as a whole, um, you know, obviously it's very it's limiting itself to the concentric circles, but there are some good examples that we can look at that highlight characteristics of this model. Um, Chicago being the, the prime example, right on Lake Michigan. Now right away, you have to make an exception for the model because the, of Lake Michigan doesn't allow for those concentric circles to exist. However, if you look at the rest of the city itself, it very neatly ties to, uh, to the concentric rings in terms of development. Even just looking at this image, you can see the CBD. You can see exactly where it is. Um, and then you can see the transition into the more residential areas marked by the tree lines. That in the, as you move near the city or just away from the city, you see areas of light industry. Um, you see some of the more of the high-rise buildings or the uh, maybe uh, apartment complexes. And then you move, as you move away, you see the trees and the neighborhoods lined with uh, you know, more densely populated areas and then into almost an entire green space where maybe you have, um, you know, which would highlight that there's probably more um, space in a, in a particular yard and less of a built up landscape. If you look at another version of, of Chicago, another image, you can actually see how this highlights the, the time period in which um, these different uh, parts of the city were built. As it grew in population, we started to see that concept of sprawl take place. Um, over time, you can see where um, the city advanced and, and also where how it also ties fa falls back to areas of, of socioeconomic status, if we were to make a, a, a cross-reference to that. 
another model, or the second model we'll look at, is what's called the sector model. Um, and this one is a little different than the concentric rings in that it focuses on some of the, the built-up landscape or even the natural landscape that's going to that's going to skew or shape the development of these urban areas. And so even though they're still considered to be a central business district, um, we see these what's basically are wedges. And you can see that already um, the shape or the, the sort of the characteristics of this model aren't rings, but sort of wedges moving away from that CBD. So we're going to see this uh, more specifically on the next slide. We'll take a look. But these radiating regions or areas that re represent different um, activities that are happening within an urban space. So um, if we look at, again, um, certain parts of, of the city may be more valuable than others. This could be in terms of living. There might be park space. There might be lakes. If you look at the Twin Cities, um, near the urban, the CBD would be like Lake Calhoun or Lake Harriet. Um, those are kind of favored places to live in residential areas, not really um, designed for industry. Um, but as, the, as we move f uh, further away from the city, that extends out into what would be today's western suburbs, um, beyond Calhoun and, and such, all, all the way out into Minnetonka, Wyzetta, Medina, those areas. Um, but we find corridors, if you will, of, of better housing, um, of park space, and you also find corridors of the more uh, tightly packed or densely populated urban housing, or the, for, and, and this is usually tied along the lines of socioeconomic status. Um, mark, you know, the smaller uh, houses, smaller yards, poorer neighborhoods, uh, more apartment complexes tend to be these lower lower class residential, and then uh, ranging all the way to the high class. You also see a transportation industry, that industry will tend to agglomerate or find itself, in this case this is the purple um, band, where you find transportation access, whether it's the rivers, um, railroads, uh, major freeways. These aren't places that people want to live next to, but businesses would prefer to be there because of the accessibility to get their goods and services um, accessible to the marketplace. The third model we'll look at is the multiple nuclei model. Now you can see this one has very little resemblance to the first two um, other than the central business district. But what we see are just pockets of various activities or services that would be um, happen throughout an urban space. And you see that there, there's less connected or, or convergence of these things in, on the central business district. Instead, they're organized in, in common areas but sort of somewhat scattered throughout the urban region. And so we see, um, again, pockets or sections of the urban area that are maybe um, higher class residential areas. Um, but also you see these sort of pockets of, of maybe in a, uh, um, a business district or an industrial region um, that maybe is supported by the local neighborhood community or is an employees, many of the people of the local area. Um, these tend to be more complex than those that, that con concentric circles we looked at with the first um, model. Um, and some, depending on what, what urban area we're looking at, um, we're, we see different types of industry or um, you know, sort of pockets that maybe have more influence than the central business district itself. If, there's a, a major, if it's a major manufacturing city and there's this uh, organized around a factory, for, perhaps there might be more um, draw towards that in the, in the local population than the actual services provided in the CBD. If we look at St. Paul as an example, we can actually see some of this happening um, in this particular image. You can see by colors just some of the areas that are done uh, are represented here, but you see this transition too in some of the, the circled areas or these transition housing where we've seen um, redeveloped loft areas. So all of a sudden it became um, residential, which was you know in the midst of a very high commercial or industrial area. Um, this is what we call gentrification, when we see older parts of neighborhoods being transformed into high value or uh, uh, very important um, uh, new residential areas that, that tend to be higher in socioeconomic status. But we look at another one, again, looking at St. Paul, um, you see these the multiple nuclei. That if you look along Grand Avenue, um, if you go across Grand Avenue that leads into St. Paul, you can see that this is, tends to be more business oriented. Um, the downtown core or the CBD of St. Paul. Um, you see a cr just across the river, along the river, we see these areas of industry. Again, that accessibility. 
Um, again, and then moving, if you look at the western part of St. Paul, you again seeing along uh, major routes of uh, the networks of freeways. Um, and uh, all along, what would, this would be um, the major arteries of, of, of highway transportation. Um, through here, you can see that the, cha the type of, of services and, and land use is very different. Um, so uh, the fourth one we'll look at, and I'll be pretty quick with this one, is the urban realms model. Um, Minneapolis, St. Paul is, is a, another example of how this can be illustrated. We have a very a core central business district, if we think about Minneapolis in particular. Um, and then we have edge cities. Uh, Shoreview would be a good example, where we, in Shoreview, you have the basic needs are met. We have the basic government buildings. We have a, a community center. We have um, retail shopping. We have grocery stores. We have gas stations. We have auto repair. We have the, all, a lot of the services that one would need on a daily basis. How we're very, we're very connected to the larger urban area or the metropolitan area. Um, we live sort of independently but within this larger metropolitan area. And when we look at these different um, realms, they're, they're different regions. So we could look at the w out west, we have like the Maple Grove area. Um, if we move out to the, west, the east side, you, see, you hear a lot about um, Ma the Woodbury area. If you move to the southeast, you hear a lot about Eden Prairie. Um, these are sort of these edge cities that could operate independently but are very much connected and part of the greater metropolitan area. The last model we're going to look at is what's called the peripheral model. And this is largely defined by the belt line that develops around urban areas. So again, you have a, a central business district, but then you have these the, a belt line of, or, or of sorts that, can, that sort of contains and creates a natural boundary within a particular place. So if you look at this other, another perspective of this, you can see the different types of um, land use that's here. And you see these industrial and, and commercial centers that are outside or along the belt line of surrounding a particular cent central business district and residential area. And that peripheral model um, has, has largely become one, a phenomenon in recent years, or the second half of the 20th century, um, because it is, represents a lot of the suburban development that we've seen throughout the country. Um, and so we have these clusters along these belt lines and these access points of transportation, where then develops these new sort of mini um, urban places. So there's essentially we create sprawl. And so because those become maybe pockets of high employment then uh, and, and activity of commercial and, and industry, um, we see people moving and establishing new neighborhoods even beyond those, uh, the rich initial ring. So we have these pockets. Uh, you know, good examples might be looking at um, what's happening in Lionel Lakes or if you look at Medina or if you look at um, places like uh, you know, on the periphery, uh, just outside of even the metro area, um, as being core examples of this peripheral model being illustrated. Unfortunately, this has also you know put a strain on resources with sprawl and providing those basic services because there's low population densities, and it's also created areas of segregation where um, the development has largely been uh, found along lines of ethnic or racial um, characteristics and it's become a natural way of segregation because of that. So we're going to look at these models more specifically in class, um, but again, after watching this, you should have a basic idea of con the concentric zone model, the sector model, the multiple nuclei model, model urban realms model, and the peripheral model.